Good morning. Welcome to Timberline. Would you stand up with us this morning as we worship? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love.
excited to teach you a new song this morning. And uh, th this morning in our message, we're going to be talking about how we are a new creation people. And uh, as a new creation people, this song talks about how we're not only made by God, but we're made for him. And we're just intended to have communion with him. So uh, just pray that blesses you as we sing this today.
God, we didn't just need improvement or an upgrade or healing. We needed to be new creations. God, for those of us found in Christ, for those of us that call us redeemed and renewed in Christ, may we know that we are no longer that person that so often our flesh tries to grasp at. We are new creations. We are given new values, new desires, new pursuits, new vision, new life in you, God. So help us not be people that try to fall back or grasp back to the old days, to the times where our desires and our thoughts were impure and not righteous, but God, lead us in new ways, in new life together as a church family, as we're going to talk about. We love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Those of you here in person, you may take a seat. Those of you online, we'd love for you to just take a minute, say hi in the comments section. We'd love to know that we're joining with you. Thank you, Pastor Patrick and the worship team for leading us in that worship, inviting us into that space and that time. If you don't know me, I'm John, I'm the campus pastor here at our Timberline Church, Windsor Campus. Timberline exists as one church with different campuses, and we always start out by saying that we know that there are many great Bible-believing, Jesus-loving churches because we want you to know that. We want you to know that we don't think we're somehow the secret sauce. We do want you to be invested and rooted and known at a local church. And so that's why one of the things we start off with each week is this slide where we invite you to text the words, I'm new, to the number there on the screen, 970-670-7863. That'll give you kind of the electronic version of our connection card. And if you're a guest or if you've been here a while but never done that, I'll tell you what happens on the other end. It, It allows me the opportunity just to reach out to you via email or text whatever you prefer, and say hi. I I love that privilege, that opportunity. Um, I'd love to connect with you. Of course, here in person, after the service, we'll be around, but if you're looking for uh, just any questions or prayer requests or anything I could help with, or like I said, just to say hi, that's a great way to do it. You can also use that number to download the Timberline app, follow along with sermon points, um, or those of us that choose to give through text giving, we can use that number as well. And Timberline family, just we always say thank you for your faithfulness. If, if you're faithful, if you've chosen to give through text giving or online giving or in-person giving, whatever that looks like, thank you for that. And guests, please know that's not something we ask or expect you to do. Before uh, we continue our sermon series on Ephesians uh, called who do we think we are? The last couple of weeks, we've been talking a lot about Timber Kids, and I've actually pulled up my kids here on the stage uh, last week just to kind of share that for Kirsten and I, it's really important to kind of show and share with you that when we say we believe in Timber Kids ministry and it's made a difference in our kids' lives, it is not just hypothetical. These are our kids' lives that have been poured into for the last six years. They've been changed. They've been having relationships with the volunteers and in this wonderful, wonderful ministry. And so we believe in Timber Kids Ministry as a family, and we believe in it as a church. We know that everybody needs connections. Everybody needs the opportunity to be known and know somebody. And that's why earlier on in the service, we said that connection to be known is a core value. That applies to kids as well. And so at our 830 service, we've been able to have a team of volunteers to offer full timber kids uh, from six months all the way through fifth grade. We haven't been able to offer the full timber kids at this 10 o'clock service yet. We're so close though. We need just a handful more volunteers. And so that's why we've been talking about it. We want to open up full timber kids ministry six months all the way through uh, fifth grade at this 10 o'clock service, but we need a handful more people to do it. Um, Of course, we have to be able to do it each week. It's not going to be on a week, off a week, on a week, off a week. So we are very close. So we want to put something possibly in your hands if you're interested in helping us get there uh, in the seat backs, either in front of you or behind you if you're in these front rows for you in-person people. Um, There's just simply a slip of paper that you can give to a staff member, guest services, or drop in the offering boxes, the black boxes in the back. Um, If you put your name, phone number, or email, so two of the three will make you a winner, and you can just uh, go ahead and fill this out, and it just lets us know that you're interested. We'll take it from there 
And like I said, our goal is so close, we need a handful more people to launch Timber Kids Ministry fully at this 10 o'clock service. I know people that have come have wanted that, expected that, even guests that are looking for that, and it'd be really, really special if we could do what we do at the 8.30 service for 10 o'clock as well. So looking forward to hopefully that. Check out these slips if you need to follow up. Well, Mackenzie Matthews is with us this weekend as we continue our Ephesians series. How are you guys? It's great to see you. Hello, good morning. (laughs) Such a treat to be with you. It's always a treat and an honor for me, but especially in the season that we find ourselves in, I'm not taking it for granted to be in the room and sing next to you. It's just a gift. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Like John said, we're continuing this series we're calling Who Do We Think We Are? All about who we are as a church, our collective identity. Who are we? Does it matter? Does it matter that we know? This series we're looking, we're asking, we're reminding ourselves of who we are and allowing that to then let us evaluate and inspire us to maybe live a little bit more the way we were called to live, created to live together. And we're doing that by unpacking the book of Ephesians. You might remember Ephesians is written by Paul. If you remember Paul, Paul Saul was the passionate Pharisee with the impressive rap sheet. He studied under the best of the best of the Jewish thinkers. He was elite as one of the Jewish religious leaders, and he was determined to destroy what he believed was this disobedient uh, Jewish community following this way of Jesus. He was the murderer of many, many of the first Christians. He was zealous in his hostility toward them until Jesus meets him along the way. He supernaturally encounters Jesus. He's blinded, stopped in his tracks, and transformed. The one who passionately persecuted the early church became the one who would receive, bless, and minister to it, which is what we're reading out of today. This letter was written to Christians in Ephesus, Um, We know that Paul wrote it from jail, which is wild to imagine. But it's this beautiful letter of encouragement. Paul's life, um, his story is one of incredible renewal and transformation and redemption. It's an inspiring picture of what God can do with a life. What he could do with our past, what he could do with our future. It's the whole book his story. Today we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, which as I've studied for this, it's so dense, so rich, so rich. We could be here talking about it all day. Maybe we should. You guys don't have anywhere to be, do you? Strap in. Just kidding. Today we want to think through like what was Paul getting at here? Who are we? Does it matter for us now? Point one, if you're following along in the app or you're taking notes, um, is that we're a new creation people, like Patrick mentioned. We are a new creation people. What does that mean? Somehow, some way, we are being made into something brand new through Jesus. Not scrapped and starting over, though. Us, our lives, our stories, our time, our world— in all its brokenness, somehow, some way, through Jesus, renewal is happening. That's our story. We are people of redemption and renewal, new creation people. We're being made into something brand new through Jesus. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, we're going to be just starting right away in verse 1. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Once You were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Paul is speaking to a group of Gentile Christians here, and he says, look back. Look back at your story. Look back at your past. See the old you and your old ways of life. Verse 4. 
But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. There's some really strong imagery here. Once you were dead in your sin, strong picture of death, juxtaposed with being given new life, death and life side by side. Unfortunately, um, many of us in the season that we find ourselves in have rubbed up close with death in this season. It feels unique. Um, So many of us at one time, often walking through grief, many of us in this room likely grieving, homesick for loved ones lost. That's you, I'm sorry, I see you there. No matter how or when, expected or not, death always crushes us. We know that life is but a vapor. That's how it's described in the wisdom literature. It's a moment. It's quick. It's fleeting. Like, life really is short. One out of one will die. Like, we know this. But it doesn't make the reality of it any harder to hold, or any easier to hold, excuse me. This last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Um, Depending on how you were raised, that might mean a whole lot to you or might not mean too much to you. But Ash Wednesday kind of marks the start of the Lent season in the Christian church calendar. It's the 40 days leading up to Easter meant to prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts and our minds to sensitize ourselves to the truth of the gospel that we celebrate at Easter, Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and the new life he's bringing. That's what we celebrate with Easter. And Ash Wednesday is the day where we contemplate our mortality, where ash is applied to the forehead as a reminder, as dust you are and dust you shall return from Genesis 3. And some of you might be wondering, like, why on earth (laughs) would we want to think of these things? How heavy. But there's something sobering and beneficial in doing so. In Ecclesiastes, there's this verse um, where it says it's better for us to go to a funeral than to go to a party (laughs) because it's good for the living to think of these things. It's better to go to a funeral than a party because it's good for the living to think about these things. One day, it will be our turn. What kind of legacy are we leaving? I don't know if you've ever had the privilege to be in the room when someone takes their last breath. I consider it a privilege, um, and I have been. And there is this finality to it, like the body that remains is no longer the person who I knew and loved, who I knew and loved is no longer here. And we don't face loss without hope through Jesus. All of our loss, all of our grief is pierced with hope, all things being made new again. But facing death and the certainty of it that it almost brings, the finality to it in this lifetime, there's a severing of relationship, there's a heavy weight. It's part of our humanity. We'll all walk through this, right? Paul takes this imagery, this metaphor, and he says, in your sin, you're dead. In the sin, we are dead. Our sin, our bending, our leaning, our nature to reject God, to try and figure out life on our own, to think that we know best, right? We all do this. It's our sin. It's infected us all. Being dead in our sin speaks to really our complete inability to do anything about the true reality of it. And if we don't understand that, if we don't take a minute To sit in that, if we've forgotten it, maybe the weight of it, the reality of it, then we miss the fullness that's here for us. In point two, which point two today, that we are receivers of unbelievable grace. We are receivers of unbelievable grace. Verse seven. 
So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he's done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. It is by grace that you have been saved, that we have been saved. This is some of the best definition of grace that we have. It's a gift. And I don't know anyone who doesn't like a gift, receiving gifts. But a gift particularly of this magnitude can be hard to receive. Maybe you get that. It's clear here, um, you can't earn this. I love the way this verse is written in the message. Eugene Peterson says it like this. Now God has us where he wants us, with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. Do you struggle with receiving this gift? Or maybe a better question, do you consciously or unconsciously live as if you could earn this? As if you could play some kind of major role in your own saving? I think about the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son that Jesus tells about this family, about two sons and a really loving dad. And the one son, the younger son, goes to his dad, says, I'd like my inheritance now. I wish you were dead. The dad somehow is fine with that, gives him his inheritance, lets him go. He squanders his wealth. And then he comes back. It's this beautiful story where you see the father running out to greet this son who is disrespectful and wild and crazy. And he invites him back in, and they have a huge party, and it's this beautiful picture of God's fatherly heart to those of us who are far away from him. But then there's an older brother in this account who we see is like, you know, he's responsible. He's there. He's honoring. He's doing all the right things. And the brother comes back, and his response is frustration. He's frustrated. Like, why are we doing this? Where's my party? (laughs) Is what he says. I don't know if you relate to the older brother at all, that heart towards the other brother. He misses the point. He misses the grace because it's undeserved. It's an undeserved gift. I think about the first time I saw uh, Les Miserables. It's a musical. Any of you guys musical people, musical fans? Okay, a couple. You know what I'm talking about then, the musical Les Miserables? Yeah. I know I'm going to confess to you that I did not watch the musical. I did see the movie with Hugh Jackman in theaters. So if that's some musical people, that's like, it's a problem. Hope we can still be friends. I'm confessing that before you. That's where I saw that. But the movie with Hugh Jackman, like, I didn't know the story before that. I wasn't prepared. (laughs) It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of a lot of ways the gospel. And I cried so hard. There's a couple different types of people in movie theaters, right? There's the movie talkers, the worst. You know, there's the people who are loud laughers in movies. And there's criers, movie criers. I find myself in the movie crier group. I cried so hard that I was like, like wiping tears off my chin hard, not just like a gentle pat, a weep. I was <laughs> weep crying watching this movie. But it's this beautiful, beautiful account. We follow this man named Jean Valjean. And early on in, in the story, he's homeless, struggling, and he's taken in by a bishop in this church. In the middle of the night, Jean Valjean steals all of this silver, and he takes off. He leaves. And he's caught by the police. He's brought back to be accused of the truth of what he is. He's a thief. And the bishop sees him coming in this moment, this beautiful moment of undeserved grace. He says, ah, you forgot the candlesticks. He runs, grabs extra silver, comes to give it to him. You forgot the candlesticks, this beautiful, touching moment of undeserved grace. And he's freed. It changes the whole trajectory of his life. It's a beautiful picture of the gift of grace. 
It is by grace that you who were stuck in this finality of the sin brokenness were seen and pursued by a kind, loving God who has given an unbelievable gift. And you do not deserve it, and you cannot earn it. This is the gospel. This is our gospel. Klein Snodgrass, in his commentary on Ephesians, um, says this, the main problem in appropriating this passage is for us to take it seriously. For the most part, we do not believe the picture of ourselves is as bad as Paul says. Are the lives we so carefully groom meaningless, a living death without God in the picture? On the other hand, we find it hard to believe that the facts are as good as Paul says. Does God really love us so deeply? And are we actually exalted with Christ in the heavenly realms? The passage is about value and hope. Without God, humanity has little of either. With God, humanity is given immense hope and lasting value. Tim Keller says it similarly when he says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. It is in receiving the gift of God's grace that we are made into something new. This is the birthplace. This is the starting point. And so my question for you today is, are you a good receiver of this gift? Receiving God's grace changes the trajectory of our lives. It's God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms us. In some of the accounts of Jesus' life, we see this sinful woman who washes Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears, and she puts perfume on him. But the thing is, she did this at a dinner party with some really religious elite men. And it's a little risque because in that time, like letting down your hair was actually this like intimate act. And so it's culturally inappropriate. It's kind of scandalous. And when the Pharisees, these like, you know, elite religious leaders see this, they express their judgment of her their condemnation of what was really an act of worship. And in that moment, in the dinner party, I wonder what it would have been like to be there, Jesus starts teaching, and he tells this story about a moneylender who forgave debts, um, some small, some big, and he asks the group, hey, who would love the moneylender the most? And it was the one who'd been forgiven of the most. Those who've been forgiven of much, love much. We need to be reminded, not just in our minds or in our hearts, of just how forgiven we are. Of just how much we need him. His grace and his forgiveness for us today, in this moment. Even if we know this story. Even if we know this gospel. To receive this and think of this again today. Some of you struggle with this um, because you try to earn it. Some of you struggle because you feel entirely unworthy of God's grace and forgiveness, of which, yes, (laughs) we all are. But when it comes to grace and forgiveness, you can think, yeah, that's nice for you. Or that's nice for them. But if you only knew me, like actually, the real me, if you only know what I have done, the truth of it, It's too ugly, it's too bad, it's too scandalous. The truest scandal, if I can put it that way, it's the gospel. The true scandal is that the grace of God goes all the way down to the bottom of the worst of the worst offenses. Even there, his grace is enough. Your scandal is not the true scandal. God's grace is that covers you is. We are receivers of unbelievable grace. More sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe, and yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. 
knowing this, and living out of this truth changes everything. <laughs> changes our identity. And it's the foundation of my point three today, which is we are living, breathing masterpiece. We are living, breathing masterpiece. Verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You note that this verse, again, is about us, which is we, together, are God's masterpiece. Out of our identity, that together we know we are deeply flawed and yet accepted and redeemed, out of that we become conduits of grace. God's workmanship in our world. The word workmanship or masterpiece here, the root word, is actually where we get the word poetry. It means something beautifully created. We have been beautifully created anew in Jesus. But we are more than just a beautiful piece of created art um, just to have. We are moving, living, breathing masterpieces. The purpose of being this masterpiece creation is to be active and productive, creating like our creator. We are made in the image of a creator. Therefore, we are creators. Often people think to be creative requires that you be in a creative profession or to be a professional artist, like a painter, musician, writer, chef, master creatives. I went to art school. It's a fun fact about me. I'm a painter, something I still pursue a lot. It's a big part of who I am, being an, an artist or someone would look at me like, oh, you're professional creative. And I see so many people who are very quick to count themselves out, to separate themselves from me when it comes to their creativity, to denounce their ability. Maybe that's you. You'd be like, raise your, raise, raise your hands. Just kidding. You know, I worked at um, a sip and paint place. I don't know if you guys have ever seen some of those. It's fun. little two and a half hour date night. But I'm like the Bob Ross, and I lead the group. Together we can do this, you know, through a painting. It's really fun. Really, really fun job. But I am amazed, amazed, and pretty saddened, to be honest, by the amount of people who would make such strong declarations about their inability. Like, I couldn't draw a stick figure. I'm terrible. I don't have a creative bone in my body. If I had a dollar for every time someone said that, all before we'd even started, I find people are very quick to count themselves out of creativity. Because of that, I think we have a whole boatload of incredibly creative people who think that they are not a whole boatload of people who sit on the sidelines when our invitation is to participate. If you are the type um, who declares your lack of creativity or your lack of ability, I need you to hear me today. Uh, it's a lie. It's a lie. You have the ability to be creative, to bring something that no one else could. Your hands, your ideas, your family, your neighborhood. You have the ability to have vision and to do something with the vision you have. It's creativity. This ability is directly tied to the image of God within you. You are a creator made in the image of our creator, invited to the table to participate with God. We as the new creation, deeply rooted, again, in that identity of the grace receivers accepted by God, beloved despite our flaws. Maybe we can let go of some of our fear of failing. <laughs> yeah. I love C.S. Lewis says this quote. He says, the world is a great sculptor shop. We are the statues. And there's a rumor going around the shop that some of us someday are going to come to life. We are living, breathing, active, participating works of art, beautifully created to participate with God. Which moves me to point four today. We are becoming a new family without barriers. Becoming 
a new family without barriers. A good chunk um, of chapter two here speaks directly to this community of Gentile Christians who found themselves in the center of incredible hostility. What you need to know here um, is that Paul is addressing a massive divide between the Jewish and Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians, the people of Israel, God's chosen people. The Gentiles, likely most of us sitting in this group, we've been crafted into their story through Jesus. At this time, many of these Jewish Christians um, were not happy about this. There was incredible racism, judgment, name-calling, entitlement, all present amongst these two group of people. Real hostility here. Verse 14 says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of the law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together, as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility towards each other was put to death. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. This is so radical. This is so profound. To have such hostility and to have Jesus at the center of it, bringing peace. Say the walls of hostility are broken down. Rivals coming together under the banner of peace carried by Jesus. He uses similar language to marriage here. Like two groups of people becoming one in Jesus. Together as one body. Two becoming one. This family. Being members of God's family. Family is where we belong to each other, right? Family can be messy. And it's sometimes in the days of social media that we live in, you can look at the perfect Instagram, like, influencer families. Very put together mom bloggers out there. They look perfect. Like they're not messy. Their kids do not cry. <laughs> Their homes are not dirty. They're always on vacation, right? We live in a world where it can seem like, well, some families must be perfect. But we know, like, family is messy. All family is messy. This family that Jesus created through this new creation was diverse. It is diverse. Different cultural backgrounds, different skin color, different customs, different opinions. Through Jesus, this new family is diverse and yet united. A new, united, messy family that lives in peace. Sounds impossible, right? Maybe you're having mental pictures of your family or your extended family dinner table and the colorful political conversations maybe you've had over the last few months. How on earth can we be diverse and yet unified, disagreeing and yet at peace? It's a big growth area for us, right? This is very relevant. How do we do this? I would suggest it has something to do with Jesus himself. Verse 20, together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Again, beautiful imagery here. I'm a sucker for good, for good imagery. A diverse family living in peace, like a house with stones held together by the cornerstone, our King Jesus. The first century listeners would have been well acquainted with this imagery. In Ephesus, particularly, there was a huge temple for the god Artemis. 
in Jerusalem, there's the Jewish temple. It was striking, massive. It was one of the wonders of the world. So hearing this, they picture it. They picture massive stones. They walk past it. They live life next to it. A temple is just a place where a god lived. Like, it's a common theme in the ancient Near East. And Paul here is saying, you, together, are his temple. You, this family, this messy family with Jesus as our cornerstone, your foundation, your peace bringer, you will be his dwelling place, his living temple. It is powerful. So what does it mean for us? We can't miss the agenda. Like, Paul is nothing if not a little repetitive. He circles grace, peace, and unity. And think about us, the church, us as the church. Could we be described with those identifiers? Grace, peace, and unity? Jesus tore down the wall used to keep each other at a distance. Reading this and hearing it correctly ought to be incredibly convicting. Be weary, pay attention to where we are focusing on the wrong things. For all the energy we spent um, arguing, all the energy we spend on wanting to be right, all the judgment and criticism that we see within the church from other Christians. Lord, deliver us from Facebook. Am I right? All of that, the time we spend on what qualifies other people as right or wrong or in or out, we look at Paul and his agenda here. If almost it could be like bold, highlighted, underlined, circled, unity. To be like family, messy, where we belong to each other without barriers, like a wide table, a diverse people who do not all think the same, living in peace, a unified dwelling of the holy, most high God. May we be people who are hospitable, if I can say that, family. May we be people who are hospitable in the face of any difference, not hostile in the face of any difference. May we be people who can hold hospitable difference and lay down hostile difference. May we, our church, the church, be people who say with words and actions that whomever our outsider is, that they belong with us before they believe the way we do, before they behave the way we do, remembering our place, our posture as people who only sit in this house, the living temple of the holy God, because of the unbelievable grace of our King Jesus. He is our cornerstone. He is our foundation. He is our peace. Our identity orbits around him and his grace. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we are moved by your grace, by the magnitude of it, by the reality of it. It's hard to receive, God. I pray for us in this room. God, would you forgive us of all the places we live as if we could earn this? Forgive us of that, God. For those in this room who count themselves out, the scandal of what they've done or where they've been is too bad. It's too much. God, in, in this place, would the scandal of your grace wash over them right now? If that's you in this moment, you can say just to God, forgive me. I receive this. I receive this. God, I pray that you would help us to be a creative group of people here to participate. Would you give us the inspiration? Would you give us the ideas? Would you give us vision? And then would you give us the courage to do something about the vision we have? And God, would you make us a temple where your name is glorified? Your house, a diverse family, would be, be hospitable 
in the face of any difference toward our neighbor. May those they have be identifiers of us, grace, peace, unity. We need you, God. We need you. an honor to be with you. Really it is. Would you stand? Let's take that heart. Take that grace. Take that moment. Remember King Jesus as our cornerstone as we sing these words. In Christ alone my hope is found my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter.
the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ we stand Amen, huh? Amen. Yes. As we go, you enter um, this next week. May you remember we are more flawed in ourselves than we ever dared to believe. We have more love and more accepted than we could ever dare to hope. May we be people and say, given of much, we love much. We carry the banner of peace. So we are new. Together, we can do that. We are that. Amen.